more tags, no tags. Hey, what is up, good people? Welcome to a brand new episode of The Midnight Drop, where we talk about movies, TV shows, comic books, social commentary, and all that good stuff. I am your host, Jordan Malone, and today is not going to be too much of a long episode. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, Quiet on the Set, the dark side of TV's television, of <laughs> TV's television, <laughs> of kids' television, uh, <laughs> and then we're also going to be talking about a little bit about The Crow, the newest Crow trailer that came out last week that got disliked heavily and just pretty much my thoughts on it as someone who's pretty much a newbie on the Crow series and just my thoughts on it. So we're going to be doing all that and more on today's episode of The Midnight Drop. You can check us out on TikTok while it's still here, <laughs> YouTube, Instagram, and also on Spotify for full episodes, both audio and video. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, this episode... Uh, I was trying to see if it was going to be uh, any much longer with like the two topics that I was going to put in with the the Nickelodeon documentary and then also with the Crow trailer. And I was thinking maybe, just maybe, uh, I could probably add in a review for a movie uh, that not a lot of people watched, uh, which was the American Society of Mar Magical Negroes. And I was like, maybe? And I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that bullshit because first of all the movie it's reviewed horribly right now like it has a 30 percent from the critic score on rotten tomatoes um i've seen multiple people including black people review this movie and say it's one of the worst of the year and after watching those reviews and listening to them i i just like i i want to watch it for myself but i'm not in a hurry and the fact that this movie only made $1.25 million in the box office and the budget is nowhere to be seen, it means that they they, they this movie is going to be one of the, the biggest bombs of the year and no one is even going to know because no one really gave a fuck. Like, this movie was dead on arrival and it, it really shows. I mean, I, if I had to touch anything on that movie before we begin, um, that movie just looked like it was dead on arrival. Like the trailer, the story, just how like the first part of the trailer, it just seemed really promising how everyone was like, oh, this is kind of like Black Hogwarts. Or oh, we're really going to be touching on that magical trope stuff, you know? And then the movie ends up becoming like a really cheesy, bad rom-com. And then like when you listen to the reviews, like there's a lot of people saying like this movie is trying to advocate for the mystical Negro trope, saying that we needed to satisfy you know, white people. And when you combine that with the whole bad rom-com and then you combine it with the fact that they are also trying to criticize white people, then you not only made white people angry, you've made black people angry, and then you just made everybody angry. And that just said that th this fucking movie was just, again, dead on arrival. No one was going to watch it. And I feel like it's going to be one of those films where people are going to wait on streaming to watch it and then talk shit about it. That's what I think was going to happen. Um, I don't even know if it's showing in any of the theaters that's around my area. So, I mean, I might have to go all the way to like Thoroughbred, which is like a theater in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, so that's like 25 minutes away from me. So I don't know if, you know, I even will be able to watch it in theaters. But I'll tell you what, I like I, I just... It's like it's disappointing to have American fiction win an award and then you get a movie like this out and you're just like, fuck, like we're we take five steps forward and then Tim steps back. It's it's so it's so weird to me. But uh but with that being said, let's get into our main stuff. Uh last night I had the pleasure of basically being in my room and watching Quiet on Set, the dark side of kids TV. And the only reason why I watched this, the only reason why I even, you know, got the time to watch this was because I, you know, was very interested in the whole drama with Nickelodeon and just what happened around that time with Dan Schneider, with Brian Peck, with several actors and actresses, kid actors and actresses from shows like iCarly, Victoria, Sam and Cat, all that, and just what their story was, because I'm going to be honest, it was a situation where I had heard it in passing, I had heard that Dan Schneider uh, did some really foul shit that, 
you know, it went from a thing to where he was one of the most beloved people in kids television because he really get kids. And he was in a situation where he created shows like iCarly and Victorious and all that. And then time went on, especially after the Me Too movement, you know, you got to understand more about Dan Schneider and especially like, you know, certain kid actors who, you know, grew up had a voice now was able to speak up and say what they had to say about, you know, their lives as, you know, TV kid TV actors. And, uh, man, it just, yeah, this whole, this whole documentary was just like a long time coming. So it premiered on the ID network, uh, but it was on HBO max. The weird part is that it shows like, like when I first checked it, it showed the first two episodes available and then you have to wait for the next two episodes to come out week to week. But then I finally got the four episodes like given to me. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to watch the four episodes. So I don't know if that was on purpose. I don't know if that was an accident or just some, like, some glitch on my end. But uh, yeah, th that's what we got. And we got four episodes of this each or, or like span around 42, 45 minutes. So I think I stayed up till like one something in the morning just watching this because I was bored and I also just was really interested. So actually, let's let's get into the trailer, actually, for Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. And let's really just get into it and get ourselves immersed in just what this documentary is all about. In the early 90s, Nickelodeon was kid everything. And you better hope that your house had cable wasn't there to educate you. We were there to have fun, to get slimed, to be entertained. And this is when Dan Schneider arrives, Nickelodeon's golden boy. He created these shows that were hugely successful for them. No one had ever really done sketch comedy starring kids for kids. He launched the careers of child actors who became major stars. For 20 years, he shaped children's entertainment and culture. Hey, thank you for being here. But that marked one of the darkest chapters. Working for Dan was like being in an abusive relationship. Dan's treatment of people on his shows was an open secret. So my lawyer filed complaints, gender discrimination, hostile work environment, harassment, and it was so devastating. How safe can any kids be in that environment? there would be even bigger problems down the line with actual pedophiles on set. These are three predators who worked at Nickelodeon, all in a short amount of time. Hey okay, guys, we're ready for you. It was a toxic environment. It made me trust people less. We were there for so many hours. You get comfortable with people until you're not. I had no idea what I was saving my son from. It was a house of horrors they find this enormous trove of child pornography. The officer said we found Ziploc bags, each one with a girl's name on it. 11 charges of child sexual abuse related to a child actor. It made me wonder who was being hurt. I've been waiting 17 years for today. It wasn't dealing with anybody on the shows or anything, right? It was a child actor. On one of our shows? Yes. Have you ever told your story publicly before? Yeah, that is, uh, that is the trailer for Quiet on set, the dark side of kids TV that again was airing on HBO Max on the Investigation De Discovery Network. And I, I have to tell you, just straight up from it, it it's pretty much your standard, you know, crime documentary, like thriller documentary, just like you uncover like these dark secrets about someone who seemed cool and everything. But the catch of it, the hook of it is that it's the subject is based on a network that we all grew up in, in my generation, in the 90s kids generation, uh, just all those kids, including myself, who got to watch these shows, and we thought nothing of it. We just thought it was just kids doing wacky shit, doing goofy shit, and then just seeing, like, our favorite shows, you know, around my time, especially with Drake and Josh, Victorious, um, 
who, who was that other show? Sam and Cat, iCarly. It was like, we just see them. We we're just like, we think nothing of it. Like, we just thought these jokes were just funny or whatever it is. And I, if I had to say anything about this, um, first off, it's four episodes, like I've said before. And the four episodes kind of go like this. And I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and bullshit you on this. I'm just going to go ahead and, like, leave a little bit of spoilers out there. The four episodes go like this. The first episode focuses on the rise of Dan Schneider, how he got into television, how he got into Nickelodeon, how he created all that in the Amanda Bynes show, and just how his presence affected everybody else and writers, pretty much setting the stage of like, okay, here's how he got in the show business, and then pretty much, you know, here's the first signs of him becoming a weirdo or becoming the Dan Schneider that we know now, where he's abusing kids he's throwing out the sexual innuendos these weird ass jokes and he's you know being a abuser being an abuser to you know female writers both physically and mentally and emotionally uh then the second episode really focuses on you know dan schneider trying to get in more with television there's a small part with amanda Bynes as she grows older and then we we get into all of that, like the second batch of kid actors after the first batch was over and after Amanda Bynes did her thing. And then it goes into the whole big episode that everyone was wondering about, the, the, the crazy story of how Drake Bell got into Nickelodeon, got in the show business, and pretty much how he got sexually assaulted and raped uh, by... Uh, Brian Peck, who has no relation to Josh Peck, Brian Peck, the dialogue coach on Nickelodeon, who's been there for years. I think he was like, I think he was known as like Pickle Boy or something. Um, and then the fourth episode is a continuation of that. And then it finally goes into Dan Schneider's uh, reach into shows like iCarly and Victorious and Sam and Cat and just pretty much like more of his disgusting behavior in like the 2000s and like more or less my time of like what I grew up in and stuff. And when you go into those four episodes, after you watch them, you're just left disgusted. You're left sad. You're just left uh, astonished at just not the actions of Dan Schneider and all these different people, but you're left astonished at, the fact that Nickelodeon as a company let this shit happen over years and that you're a grown as mofo. I don't know how to spell it. You're, you're a grown as mofo and you're just sitting there and you're just like, dude, like <laughs> how could a lot of these jokes fly over my head? Like we've seen these jokes of all these different shows come in and just, you know, let it just happen and stuff. And we're just like, okay, like as a kid, we just saw this, saw these things, and we were we we thought nothing of it. And now we're, we're pretty much older now, and like with this new mindset, we're just like, holy shit! Like this is, this is weird. Like this, like did like how can this get on a kid show? Like the argument would be made that like, okay, the reason why this got on is because you're trying to attract adults. And you're trying to get people to watch this as well, get them to laugh a little bit too. I think it's like the argument that we say for a lot of animated shows or kids shows that, you know, you don't want to just be for the kids. You want to be for the adults as well. So you add in small things that are really dope uh, that, you know, get adults chuckling a little bit while the kids just think nothing of it. But when it happens in live action in live action kids shows and you see that and it happens multiple times, it starts to get very weird. There was actually a whole uh, video where it shows all of the creepy moments of Dan Schneider, both, you know, behind the scenes and also like stuff that he did in the shows. And I'm actually going to try to show it to you a little bit because it it's a point where you're sitting there and you're just like, holy shit, this is, uh, this is insane. Honestly, man, like this, like you watch this and you're like, Dan Schneider, what the fuck, bro? I write hat of spoons and we get hat of spoons. a hat of spoons. A hat of spoons. <laughs> This is why I'm in Hollywood. Yeah. Eat your cereal, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, nah, that's, uh, nah. Nice things about me? Because I will tase her if necessary. 
Uh-oh. I have the taser. <laughs> we haven't had to use it in a long time. But I said lots of nice things. So I said nice things about you, too. Oh. <laughs> That's going to get on TV. What? That's going to get on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you get the picture, right? Dan Schneider just doing all of this, this, this foul weirdo stuff, man. And it's just, it, it's just him just, just going in and and just being the creep that we all start to know, right? Uh, right here you see Ariana Grande and the cast of, I think I want to say Victorious, uh, who is pretty much just like scared as hell and like they don't really have that much to say on it, man. And, um. I, man, as you get old, as you, as, as more comes on, there's like, this whole video is eight minutes. So like you, you start coming in, you start realizing like this shit is serious. Um, so with that being said, I mean, this whole documentary focuses on Dan Schneider and just how he, he essentially rose into fame by basically wanting to prove that he was this creative writer. That he wanted, that he he wanted to show people that he's not just the fat kid that you can just make funny ass fat jokes on and on and on about. He was someone that had talent, and so he goes into different shows. He starts writing some shows a little bit, and then he gets his rise to fame by getting into Nickelodeon, and then he starts to develop shows like All That, and All That was pretty much his his, his baby, his little baby, to where he was able to do what he wanted that grew him into prominence. And I think the start of all the crazy shit happens with All That, to where you start questioning his methods to like how he gets to certain jokes. Uh, there are some jokes to where you start to, you see the start of the sexual innuendos and just how kids were exposed to that. You get to see pretty much, um, you know, how he handled certain actors and actresses. Uh, there is a small part where it goes into how, man, it, it goes into just how, um, these kids, these child actors were put into certain pedestals and were given certain expectations to meet that was just really harmful to people or kids that age. Like, there's one actress there who's told that, like, hey, you're going to have to lose a lot of weight because we already got a fat kid. And then the expectation is that you're going to have to lose weight because you got to fit, like, this quote, the status quo that we got. And then as you as she gets older puberty hits her and then they're just like oh she's a grown woman or she looks like a grown woman we can't have her on a show that's supposed to be snl for kids so we're gonna go ahead and replace her with amanda Bynes. that was who was dan schneider's golden child and it's to a point to where you see the effects of that and it's really really fucked up um and with all that, you have the rise of Amanda Bynes and you have this special section of episode one and a little bit of episode two that focuses on the relationship between Dan Schneider and Amanda Bynes. Real talk, Dan Schneider, I think, really, really, really wanted Amanda Bynes. If Amanda Bynes was older and everything, I think he really, really would want to be with her because he was grooming that child to pretty much be his girlfriend or whatever. That, he was treating her like a golden ticket and it was like the weirdest shit to see it in action and you're just sitting there just like wow dude this is this is uh this is this is a little insane and the the the, the crazy part about it is that when you start seeing you know pretty much the repercussions and all of the stuff that happens with like how Amanda Bynes is now like, Dan Schneider is at fault for all of this type of crap, man. And it, it even goes further on to how, like, Dan Schneider was even trying to get Amanda Bynes this new level of independence and freedom just to be able to get away from her parents because they told her, no, you can't have a boyfriend that's older than you and you can't do this and that. And, you know, thankfully, you know, his appeal got rejected and, you know, Amanda Bynes was left alone on that. But it was to a point to where things could have got a little bit worse if Dan Schneider got into more of Amanda, ba Amanda Bynes life. And, and that's not even to say that like Amanda Bynes life is, is, is not as bad as it could have been. No, it's bad. It's just, 
it could have been a lot worse if he would have been able to be like dig dig his hand into more of her work as she got older and, and that's something that the episode pretty much shows um you talk about how Dan Schneider was just being an asshole to female writers, which I, I'm not even going to say that's a, a total Dan Schneider thing. I feel like that's just, that's just, a, that's just a, a whole thing, which is back in the day with white men and just being in the business. If you weren't a white man, a young white man or older white man, you're going to have to jump through a lot of hurdles and you're going to have to go through a lot of bullshit. And you see that in the first episode and also in the second episode where Female writers who are trying their very best to get into shows like All That were given opportunities, but then weren't given the equal sort of platform to thrive in those types of positions. Um, you have women in there who talked about how they had to split salaries between each other because, you know, Dan Schneider or the, the Nickelodeon executive said, hey, we can't pay you. Uh, as much because we're you know this is a fringe type of show and turns out they hire young white writers male writers who were able to you know get full salaries were able to get all the benefits and they didn't have to work as hard and you're not totally surprised by that you're disgusted but you're not surprised because that's just the name of the game and that's not to you know go ahead and to absolve anybody of that i'm just telling you the truth the name of the game is that if you ain't white or a man <laughs> you ain't getting shit <laughs> you like you think about it it's like bro you got a whole pie and you think that everybody get a slice of the pie no you are given this tiny slice of the pie and this other person right there that white male and all that they get a big slice so a young white male oh shit uh hold on a second Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Just wait to fade to black. These don't be shut the fuck up. Um, a young white male can get a bigger slice of the pie while everybody else out there, black, female, any other ethnicity, if they find out that you're gay or lesbian or trans, you get a smaller piece of the pie. Hell, if they find out that you're gay or lesbian or trans, it's a gamble if even you're going to have that job. So... That, that's one thing to say right there. So when I say that, it's not to mean like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, he, you know, he's trying to say this is OK. It was just back in the day. No, I'm not saying it's OK. I'm saying it's bullshit. But I'm saying it's bullshit. But it's just an, it's just a thing that did happen. And it's just like, yeah, when I see stuff like that from like the 90s and before, even the 2000s and before, um, I'm not really totally surprised about it. So that's just what it is. Um, but you get to that, and I think if you combine the two episodes and, and just bring them in, like up in like a summary, the like these kid actors, like I'm like this, like this, this these first two episodes just remind you, um, take your kids to school. Don't think about letting them be an actor or an actress, and if you are going to let them be an actor or actress, uh, be on their tippy toes, be like a hawk in the air circling around just make sure you keep an eye on them make sure you watch them as much as you can because man it's like it, it's one thing to deal with the pressures of being a child actor or actress and having to deal with all of that stardom just at you at a very young age but it's one thing to deal with bullshit where you're mentally and physically abused and as a parent, you can't really do anything about it because if you say something, if you speak out, um, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to get told that you're difficult to work with and your child's probably not going to get any sort of opportunities, not only in that platform they were in, but in that network and also just in Hollywood. Um, and then you have to watch out for the pedophiles that's in the network because there's a lot of instances where it's just like, okay, Nickelodeon was just stupid and didn't know that they hired pedophiles to be part of their network. Like, and, and there's one person that we'll talk about later on because that's a whole big thing. But the fact that they, they allowed so many problematic people to work on this platform, to work in this network, it shows that 
Nickelodeon was oblivious and they just cared more about the money and the ratings. And for the child actors that had to deal with this shit, it is insane. It is really insane the lengths that they had to go to and how it affected them now. Like, it's not, it, it ranges from small things to big things. Like, the small is that some of the actors said that they didn't want to deal with, you know, they, didn't, they started trusting people a little bit less. They were, they're on guard a little bit. Or just like, you know, over time, as they got older with, you know, a, a more mature mindset, they realized that some of the things that they dealt with was really fucked up. And that's just normal for a lot of people. We're like, we, we start to grow up and we realize that certain things that we did when we were children or certain things that happened to us was really, really, really fucked up. And all we can do is process that and say, okay, if I have children on my own, I'm not going to let that shit go. I'm not going to let that shit happen. But then it goes into bigger things about how, man, it's pretty much like uh, you have kids who are you have kids who have now grown now who are saying like i've had to go to therapy for this you know mentally i have been fucked over uh and i don't know how to deal with this there was one dude who was part of uh i guess the later seasons of all that who had to go through it a lot and i'm gonna put up right here because he is someone who I who I wanted to talk about for a little bit, and that was the one who had the, the it was the black it was the black kid. I can't remember his name, and I do not want to be disrespectful, but yeah, I think it was Brian Hearn. Yeah, Brian Hearn. Uh, this guy right here, Brian Hearn. This is the guy that really like I I took notice on because you know obviously he's a black man. I'm a black man, and. He talks a lot about how he dealt with sort of racial microaggressions or just racism in general, which is the certain skits that he did, uh, certain things like certain attitudes that I'd be given towards him, you know, how he was pretty much side eyed as like the difficult one. And it really wasn't even him. It was pretty much his mom. His mom, I think, was one of the only moms in TV to say like, yo, this is fucked up. Like, there's a scene in the goddamn show, in the documentary, where they talk about a skit where Brian Hearns, as a kid, had to dress up as a superhero, I guess like a nose man or whatever like that. And, you know, like he has like like these like these things of noses on his shoulders, and he has like this enlarged prosthetic nose on his on his face, and then She's the only one in the room to say, does anyone not think this look like dick and balls here? Like, this is insane. Like, this is actually insane. And because of that, and other reason, other times he said, she said stuff and spoke out. Um, you know, she got, she got, she and her son got axed from all that. They pretty, they pretty much just like, they pretty much just told her, that like your problem, he's a problem. We don't want you here anymore. And you know, besides that, like she and her child talked about how, you know, they had to deal with, you know, just you know how like the racism part, and just like how there's certain things that they wouldn't let slide. And I think it all boils down to just how he was trying to get his family out of the hood which I wouldn't be surprised if Dan Schneider or everybody used that to their advantage but simply didn't give a fuck about it. And it goes into this whole big thing about how, man, like, man, like, you're told as a child at times, a black child, that the only things that you can do to be successful, to get out the hood, is to get into entertainment or be into sports. Anything else it is a steep climb. And this kind of showed you that even in that situation, it's a steeper climb. And you just, it's, man, it's some really fucked up shit, man. So I want to find clips and I want to put them out here and kind of show you what I'm talking about. Uh, and then last thing we'll talk about from episode one is that there's even a point where they talk about some of the female employees. There's two women in general. And there's one who talks about the culture of Dan Schneider's writer's room. 
And they're both of them, both of the writers just talk about how like, yeah, he was he was just really misogynistic. He was just fucked up. And I'll show you a clip right here, just a little piece of it that'll show you what's going on with it. If I can the opportunities for if I can show you pretty much what they said on HBO Max, I will go ahead and get to it. Cause I took some notes and I want to go ahead and get to the note part of it so we can get to it. The opportunities for women were fewer. You knew you were going in for the one spot. And this is way back in 1999. There were forums where people would talk about writing, and it was in one of those groups, a television comedy writing group. Dan Schneider was in that group, and he had said that he was working on this new television show for Nickelodeon. So I just took a shot and I asked him if he would read my work. And the story that he told me later was that Dan gave them to his writer's assistant and said, you know, read through these and rate them funniest on top. He was surprised to find that mine was on top, and that's what prompted him to call me. I was actually sitting at my desk at work. One of the producers called me and told me that, you know, congratulations, we're offering you a staff writer position on The Amanda Show. This was like a dream come true. I had been in LA for seven years, and so it felt very satisfying that um, someone was gonna pay me to write comedy. I remember speaking to the line producer, and she said that I was going to have to split a salary with a writer that I did not know. So they were getting two for the price of one. They were going to hire two women and have them share a salary. And I never saw it happen to any of the men. I was like, well, I'm excited. I get to stop temping. This was my dream job. <laughs> I mean, this is what I wanted. This is why I worked so hard for. You, I'm not about to turn it down. I thought to myself, don't be a complainer, you know, do whatever you have to do to get this job. Yeah, I mean, I mean it doesn't go too much into the culture. It just goes in pretty much their, their, their upbringing, like how they got into it. But I will say for one, I'm producer. Uh, and I will say for one, just with this entire, you know, this entire series in this episode, you cut to her, the shit that she had to go through was ridiculous. And I'm not, you know, she had to go through some shit. And then also this writer, she got fired. She got let go. I don't know what, because she just took some extra off days, just three extra off days, just two weekends or whatever. They let her go. And she was actually great. And she had to do some other demeaning shit that was, well, was really fucked up. She even talks about how there was a whole situation where, you know, Dan Schneider told her, hey, could you do this for me? And I'll give you, go ahead and give you, you know, 300 bucks for it. Could you eat like two pints of ice cream? Uh, for 300 bucks as a joke she does it throws up and then she doesn't get the money yet and then she has and then he asks her to do one more thing and she's just like she makes a little joke about it and says like oh i'll just put it on your tab and then he gets he gets mad it becomes a thing where it's just like don't you ever say that shit to me again how dare you and it's just like whoa 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 my nigga damn <laughs> it, just, it just goes in for like I, like she's like hey can i go ahead and uh someone i'll pay someone to give me a massage like really really bad right now which is another thing he did that was really fucking creepy like I'll, I'll give someone 30 bucks to massage me and she's like i'll do it but i'll put it on your tab and he's just, and it's just like come here get the fuck over here and then it's just like but what can i do for you don't you ever say that shit to me again that's li that's literally what he does um um what what was it there, there were, it was like a it was like a family guy joke that uh that reminded me of that and it was just it, it like I if you had to if you had to go ahead and, and like describe it any way possible. Um, no, I want to say it's the crows. Uh, I'm gonna go to two. I'm gonna go to two. This one, there, there's like one where it's just like this is this is pretty much how that relationship was with Dan Schneider and and all the and the female writers in there that they say in the show. Cause in this one, it, it really brought my head to this one. La la, look at me. Ooh in my office now <laughs> yeah that's pretty much what that is i uh yeah yeah no just yeah there's a there's another one in there where it's just i, I want to bring it up and i might put it in post or in editing but it's it's really fucking weird crazy man but um yeah uh yeah like dan schneider was just a complete asshole 
And I'll just jump into like episode four real quick because I know episode three really focuses on Drake Bell. And so episode four, it goes into more of that. And it goes more into just his reach with iCarly and Victorious and everything. And yeah, like he pretty much just got exposed by Jeanette McCurdy after she made her book, I'm Glad My Mom Died, and talked about her life and talked about her time in television and just talked about how it was just all bullshit with Nickelodeon and with Dan Schneider. Just about how this guy was abusive. This guy, ooh, I'm, apologies for that. This guy was abusive. This guy pretty much was sexualizing young actresses and actors for the sake of comedy and for himself. Uh, this man had a massive ego. He was completely rude and was just an ass to anyone who opposed him or asked him questions. It's to a point to where you're thankful of Jeanette McCurdy to come out and be honest and just say, yo, this is some really fucked up shit. This is some this is some stuff that should not be happening and someone's got to hold him accountable. And if no one's going to be do it, it it might as well be me. And <laughs> I I I man, it's like the age of technology as it rose. You you start noticing that that's when Dan Schneider got fucked. Like when Dan Schneider started recording himself in all the interactions with everybody on set on all these different shows, that's when you start to realize, like, yo, like, this dude, this dude was stupid enough to put himself out there to leave a whole trail for people to follow and to call him out on this bullshit. Like, that's the thing. And I, I think that's something that I took away from it. In the age of technology, especially in the age that we're in now, a lot of people got really comfortable and oblivious to the fact that you are now leaving a trail of all of the things that you've done. And it's lead to things like the Me Too movement. It's leads to the cancel culture movement. It's lead to the, the, to the things that we are in now. So now we're now opening up and exposing certain people, especially in Hollywood, that do heinous shit. And especially with the time that we're in now to where I'm not, I, like, you can say whatever you want. We're politically correct, woke, whatever the fuck you want to say. I don't give a damn. We're at a time now to where we're like more aware about shit. We're more knowledgeable about certain things in terms of a social culture movement. And we start to pinpoint where these things happened way before and say, is that person still famous? Is that person still doing what the fuck they doing? And, it, and we start to realize that it flew over our heads because we weren't really exposed or open or knowledgeable about those things and now that we are we're, we're pretty much leading to documentaries like this to where we're saying okay this is uh this is this is crazy this is weird so yeah and and it and it leads to all these different videos that we see here right now before the documentary where people talk about dan schneider and all the scandals he had and you know everything going on and it becomes this whole thing and uh, and that's one thing I will say is that, you know, before this documentary, you had a lot of great YouTube video essays that talked about or touched on Dan Schneider around that time. It just it just kind of rounds it out and just shows that like, yo, like this is this is what he was all about. And I think what's really crazy is that when they really focus on like Ariana Grande and what he did to her. That's when it's just like, ooh, I was surprised that Ariana Grande didn't want to have a say or a voice on this documentary or didn't want to, you know, talk about certain things. I was just like, I wouldn't be mad if she came on and just said what she had to say about it. But it, then again, it's probably just, you know, you know, a whole thing that, uh, you know, that she probably doesn't want to revisit. And she's just like, I don't want to deal with this shit no more. I'll, I'll go ahead and go and show you what the fuck I'm talking about. It's crazy. Have you ever said something, like a sentence, and thought to yourself, wow, like, I bet nobody else on earth has ever said those exact words that I just said. That happens to me a lot. So now, just for fun, I'm going to say three sentences that I bet not one person has ever said before in the history of mankind. Sentence number one. Oh, man, my uvula got stuck between that hamster's toes. See? That could never happen, because your uvula is that swingy thing in the back of your throat right here. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That. Yeah. That we were kids that flew right over our heads. We were either laughing and our parents in the background was going, what the fuck? So there's no way you could get it stuck between a hamster's toes. Sentence number three. Ah! I'm soaking wet. Quick, somebody bring me the ocean. No one would ever say that. Why? Because if you were soaking wet and you were upset about it, the last thing you'd want is for somebody to bring you the ocean. Because the ocean is even more wet than even the wettest person in the world. Have you ever tried to get your whole big toe in your mouth? Check this out. Sometimes I wonder if you can get juice from a yeah, yeah, This is This is the big one. This is the one that, that was all over the documentary and everybody was like, what the fuck? This is the one that, that made that made audiences and the people in the documentary say, what, 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 what how, how, the, how the fuck did we let this shit go? Is it possible for a teenage girl to drink water upside down? And this mm, one. I'm thirsty. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> this has been me in a video. <laughs> Come on, give up the juice. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah, no, we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna go back into that. That's, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I would not have been mad if Ariana Grande just got back on the documentary for like a, like a fifth episode and just said like, yeah, that shit was really fucked. Or if she just went in and said like, yeah, that was, it was really crazy. Uh, this is five years ago, so she probably did say something. I don't know, but all I have to say is that Dan Schneider's jokes, it, it reminds you of like that one kid who is trying so hard to be popular, to show that he's funny. And he just ends up becoming a fucking creep and you want to call the police. You want to send this guy to the slammer. Like, this guy is pretty much just, like, trying so hard to be edgy and trying to get away with stuff because he knows he has power and that he has some sort of, like, like, what, what was it? I don't know. What, what like It's some sort of complex where he's trying to prove something to people even though he's already in these positions of power and you could already tell from the first episode that like he had like some sort of like chip on his shoulder what it seemed like or he thought i had to go i'm like everyone's out to get me i gotta prove something and you know what i could do what the fuck i want and that's what happens when someone has power when someone has all of that influence do whatever the fuck they want they start getting weird about it and they start doing stuff and, it, and, and like once you have a good amount of power it really shows what kind of person you are, what kind of man or woman, whoever you want, whoever you are, what type of person you are. Once you have all of that, your true self comes out. And with Dan Schneider, all of that power, influence, and fame showed that he was a creep, that Nickelodeon keep being on to create shows and everything so that they can go ahead and make all of the money and get all the ratings and get all of the fame from it and now nickelodeon is just like oh we, we don't allow that shit to happen you know we're trying to be better it's crazy how every episode ends with a statement from nickelodeon saying we don't condone this shit as to save their ass but you let this shit happen for decades so it doesn't absolve you from all the stuff that happens it pretty much just says yeah what the fuck nickelodeon like come on now it just it, it gives a look into just Hollywood, especially for kid actors and actresses. And it's just like, OK, you clearly just don't give a fuck unless it gives you like, you know, problems or repercussions. You know, that that's just what it is. If it brings in money, if it brings in all these positive things, they turn away from it. They just said, oh, well, we don't know him to be that type of guy. You know, it's just what it is. There's a point where it's like, you know, they'll say like, oh, well, you know, he's just he's just a, a tortured uh, genius. You know, he's someone who has these weird ways of getting to success. So, you know, you just have to deal with it. 
But as soon as that person pro causes problems, it becomes a thing to where, oh, okay, we, we ain't going to allow this shit at all. We're trying to get with the times. <laughs> I, I just say it right now, fuck you, Nickelodeon, for doing, letting this shit happen. Fuck you. Um, but with that being said, this goes into the, the, the big episode that I think everyone really, you know, wanted to get on this for. And that was the Drake Bell episode. That was the one where everyone was like, I want to go ahead and watch this documentary because I want to see what Drake Bell's time was on, on pretty much Nickelodeon as a child actor. And it all leads into the whole revelation that if you were someone who remembered the whole controversy with, um, you know, with Brian Peck, the coach, the dialogue coach had like molested and sexually assaulted a young child. You are like, okay, who was that child? And all these years later, now, you know, it was Drake Bell. And, and this is coming after, you know, Drake Bell's time at Drake and Josh, you know, the Amanda show, and then being a musician, being in all these different movies and other kids' TV shows. Uh, at one point, he was the voice of Spider-Man, and then everything went downhill when, you know, he himself was being a pedophile, and he himself was making decisions that were really fucked up. And I can go into that whole rabbit hole and stuff, um, but this documentary sheds a light on what happened to him and pretty much, um, if I go into it, man, Brian Peck, the dialogue coach, was a sick fuck who took the opportunity to use Drake Bell as his little toy. He not only groom, tried to groom him, but pretty much tried to put him in a position to where, okay, he's my little boy toy until he becomes a man. And he was being real slick about it, going to mind manipulation and, and, and manipulating a whole bunch of people to be on his side. And that is really fucked up. Drake Bell started as he was really young, was with his father, who was also on this documentary, who, uh, who pretty much, you know, was like saying like, hey, I was doing my very best uh, to keep him in a position where he was not only getting the roles he wanted, but he was safe. You know, you could say like he's one of the good parents. He's just like, I wasn't really familiar with this entire landscape of television for kid actors or actresses. And I was like, hey, I'm going to do my best to, you know, get my child out there, but also keep him safe. He was one of the ones that saw Brian Peck do what the fuck he did. He was one of the ones that said Brian Peck is a predator. And no one really believed him because, A, Brian Peck was powerful in the network and Nickelodeon because he's been there for years since all that as Pickle Boy. And then also, um, I think it was the thing that he came out as gay. And they were just saying, well, you're being a homophobe, which that's something <laughs> to call someone homophobe. And in Hollywood itself uh, can be homophobic as fuck before the times we live in now. That's something. But, yeah, he was pretty much gas lit it on for, you know, for just, you know, protecting his child. And it pretty much Brian Peck manipulated a whole bunch of people, manipulated uh, him and Drake Bell's mother to pretty much say, like, yeah, you need to go ahead and just take away, get you got to get Drake's dad, you know, ability to, to, to be around his own son away. You got to be able to say, like, hey, he's not his manager anymore. He's not his little uh, guardian anymore. You know, get him to be his mom because Brian Peck knew that he could get away with a whole lot more stuff if if he could just go if he could go ahead and get his uh mom to be part of you know talent managing Drake Bell, and that's what happened. And I'm gonna try to get a picture of of Brian Peck real quick so I know what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, Brian Peck got away with so much shit, and like you would think as someone who is not really like, what's the word? You would think as someone who's not really knowledgeable of the situation 
to be like, okay, so this is a one time thing and and someone called him out and that's when he got arrested. No. This dude right here, this dude not only assaulted and molested Drake Bell once, he did it multiple times. I think it was years, but he did it multiple times. He got away with it by saying, oh, I was just trying to make him more comfortable and like, oh, I was just, you know, doing all I can to to make him feel good. And, you know, there's other things, other excuses. This man was a bona fide, disgusting piece of shit. You can't mince words out of it. He did all that. And he only got 16 months in jail. You know why? Because. He was very powerful. He had, or not really just powerful, he had influence. He had influence all over Hollywood, in the realm of kids' television, in sitcom television. He had people uh, like James Marsden to even back him up, which that surprised me, James Marsden, which I'm not, I'm, I, listen, I'm, I'm going to be real. James Marsden's probably going to catch a lot of flack when Sonic 3 starts, you know, press runs and starts, you know, getting released out there. Someone's going to bring that shit up. There's going to be a boycott for Sonic and saying we can't watch Sonic 3 because James Marsden is is a, is the problem because of what happened with Brian Peck and Josh and Drake Bell. You know, you know, this guy had influence from other people. Uh, some of the actors from Boy Meets World had his support because he was able to manipulate those people and say that, yo, uh, what they're trying to do to me is wrong because I'm gay and that, you know, I would never do something like this. I'm the nicest person in the world. But in reality, he was a sick piece of shit that manipulated not only children, but their parents of children to let him do what the fuck he wants to do. And Drake Bell was pretty much in a position to where I I can't I I I'm I got I can't let this go on like I don't want this to happen to me but I can't do anything because I might lose my seat. I might lose my seat in the table. I might lose all the opportunities. I might have to go learn how to wax surfboards and it becomes a thing where I like he had to keep quiet and that becomes a thing to where a lot of people can relate to. You know how, like, you're in a position, you're at a job, and, like, you see some crazy shit at your job, but you're afraid to speak up because you may might lose said job, and you're afraid of, like, the negative consequences that come from it to where, okay, if I lose this job, I, I, I won't be able to find another job like this for a minute because you don't know how much influence that person has. Or that person implements scare tactics to say, like, yo, uh... You you do whatever you want to do, and I'll make sure you never work in this town again. I'll ma I'll, I'll make sure that I, I'll say things to people that that will negatively uh, impact you to where you won't be able to survive sometimes. And that's what happened with Drake Bell. You know, Brian Peck didn't say that to him up front, but that was behind Drake's mind to where if I say something, I'm gonna get fucked. And it only took the courage of him and his i think his then girlfriend's mom to speak up and say like yo we got to take you to therapy we got to let this shit go on and then we and then it get to a point to where he just exploded to his mom and told him everything and then that's when the police were called and then that's when at the beginning of episode four we get to the point to where drake is identified as jane doe goes and speaks at the stand at the court hearing and then he visualizes how he you know brian peck had all these different people on his side saying like, yo, like I should be acquitted all these charges. People writing letters to the judge saying like, I think he should only get parole and that, you know, there should be no punishment for what he did. And if there is stuff that he did, it was completely out of character. It was even points to where he said, you know, some actors and actresses said Drake Bell may have even, you know, tempted him to do this stuff. It may have been his fault. It was temptation. That's what it was. It wasn't based on his own will. It was just temptation. And even if it was temptation, my, my, my question is, and I know this is from years ago, but my question is, if it was temptation, why are you absolving this motherfucker from doing this shit? You know? Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me be real. If it, was, if it surely was temptation, why are you absolving this man from any wrongdoing? That is the most backward ass shit that I've heard in terms of stuff like this. It's so weird. And, and you know what? I just thought of this. 
this now adds more fuel to the fire to the people, to the conspiracy theorists, to the people who believe that Hollywood is a bunch of sickos and that it's you know it's a you know it's all a bunch of it, it's a bunch of pedophiles and people who are sacrificing others to a cult, you know. And, and this just adds fuel to the fire because now you have evidence to prove that there are people like Brian Peck. And, you know, my I, I can go on about my whole my whole thing about that, my opinions on those things and how sometimes that can be problematic because then you, you you say everyone who's in Hollywood is selling their soul or are pedophiles and stuff. And that's further from the case. But there are people in Hollywood who abuse their power for their own selfish gain. And Brian Peck is one of them. So, you know, this goes in, this whole docuseries ends on, you know, the the former kid actors talking about how this influenced them. And, you know, how Drake Bell talked about how how this kind of fucked up their, his relationship with his family and especially with his father and talked about how it led him to just go into dark paths. And I, you know, and this isn't to say I absolve him from everything that he did. Drake Bell did some fucked up shit too that, you know, he had to take some accountability on. But this does give you a bit of insight and perspective as to how he got to that path that, possibly he did all he did as to cope through all the bullshit he did as a kid actor. And at that point, you got to be like, man, this is very eye opening. And I thought that was a great part of the documentary. That was a part of the documentary that you couldn't really get from YouTube at that point. And I thought that was really cool. If there was any criticism to give for this documentary, it was to probably say that, um, again, it's like your pretty standard crime thriller documentary, uh, that that goes in the cycle that you know it's going to go on. It doesn't do anything crazy. And I don't think it does need to do anything crazy. It's just what it is. Um, but also, it's like, if you go on YouTube, there are some things that they go really in-depth with, and it doesn't come in with this crazy editing or anything like that. It's just straight to the point. So that's one thing I will say. I will say on that. And for this being a four-part series, at first I thought, well, maybe they just need to do this like a two-hour documentary. No, there's a reason why they did four parts, because they really need to get into it. But I will say, like, there was probably some more stuff that I wanted to know here and there. But in general, I mean, if anything, I, I recommend you watch this entire documentary, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, because it is a very important documentary that talks about the bullshit with kids TV. Even if it only focuses on Nickelodeon and that side, um, it, it does touch on some things with you know, just kids TV and the, the landscape of Hollywood for them and how it's very dangerous and it can be very, very impressionable on them. So that's something that I want to, you know, bring up and just be honest about. So that's, uh, that, that's something that I want to touch on. And, uh, I'm glad that I got to talk about it. I'm glad I got to watch it and I hope you guys, you know, go ahead and watch it and give your opinion on that too. Oh, and if there's one thing to add in, um, I can't remember their names. Uh, it was like this. It was like a director and a stage director that that was good friends with Brian Peck. Fuck them. Fuck them. If I can find them or some, yeah, fuck them. The same. They were the same people who worked on the Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. And one thing to add in with the Brian Peck stuff. Uh, Brian Peck not, had supporters who you know he influenced and said that hey. Um, if I, I was told some misinformation, you know, so I probably, you know, was put in the mindset where like, I didn't really know what was going on and I just followed him blindly, but I disavow everything that he's done. But, um, there's even people and it was like these, it was this couple that worked on the Amanda show and worked on other properties, especially with Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. And they were just like, well, we felt like he was tempted and then when they were asked again about it, they said the situation's over. So what's there to talk about? If I ever see those people on another TV show, I'm, I'm, I'm turning off my TV. If I see them on the street, I'm calling they, they asses out. Because the fact that you let that ish happen and then you're just like, oh, it is what it is. I don't care if it was years ago. That's still fucked up. The fact that you were just like, it is what it is and just moved on with it. That shows how, what kind of people you are. That's just all I have to say on that. That's just that's just what I had to add in on that one. That was just that was just crazy. 
All right, we're approaching about an hour into this episode. We spent pretty much spent this entire time talking about that documentary. Uh, I'll just touch on the crow a little bit because I'm I'm gonna be real. I don't think there's too much to talk about with the crow and just this entire thing with it. Uh, man. Oh, okay. Okay. There's a, (laughs) you know what? I'm sorry. As soon as I typed in the crow, here's what happened. Here's the trailer for the crow. And then here's a trailer for rebel moon part two, the scar giver. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to talk about the crow and talk about my thoughts on the new movie on the reboot. And then I'm going to talk about Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver. We're going to show, see it real quick because I got to go somewhere in a little bit. But here are my thoughts on the Crow trailer. And I just want to be real and just be honest about this and get this out there. The Crow is a cult classic. It is a film that a lot of people love for its gothic tones, for its behind the scenes story, and just for the character in general. And... In Hollywood, we always know they love to make the reboots or sequels of just these classics that people can't get enough of. And most of the time, they end up being mid. Sometimes it ends up being amazing. A lot of times they end up being ass. Uh, And I guess with The Crow, I want to say this. They made a reboot or a a reimagining of it. It's the first thing you like. Sorry. A reimagining of it. And one of the things about this, and I'm just going to put it up here right now. One of the things about The Crow, this trailer, is that it got a lot of people angry. It got a lot of people upset just for how it looks more modern than anything. And you know what? After a couple days of just watching it and, and, and watching the old crow movie for the first time and thinking about it, which I might have a video on that as well. If there's anything I want to say about this series is that, or if there's anything I want to say about this new movie they got going on, I genuinely think that it's not the fact that it's going to be horrible. It's the fact that it's going to seem like it's every other superhero comic book movie or action movie that 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 does, doesn't really push anything. That's the vibe it gives me. You know, you know, this movie might actually be really, really good. It might just be fun in terms of the action sequences and the acting from Bill Skarsgård. Bill Skarsgård looks like he is going to elevate this movie a little bit. And I, I think he'll be the one that carries it a bit as well. And these action sequences, as you see them right now, it, it's bloody as fuck. They're there. It's it's full on mature, like right there. God damn. <laughs> like you're right there. You're seeing that. And you're just like, OK, that might be the saving grace of this movie. They're going for like this sort of John Wick style, style this, this really violent nature. But you go into the movie and it, and it still feels like it's going to be something that's just what you've seen before. It doesn't seem like something to where it stands out from the crowd or it's anything interesting or or symbolize itself as, oh, this is the crow. Like maybe in a sense of in a negative way from a lot of longtime fans and, 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 you know, and fanatics of it. But in terms of just, you know, any other moviegoer, someone who's like me, who's never seen of the crow, they're going to be like, this just seems like any other action movie. That's just what it is. So I'm not, you know. People are not mad about it that it's going to be horrible unless you're part of those toxic fandoms. People are upset about it because it just seems like it's just going to be ordinary. That it's going to be something that you've seen before. That you're not going to be enthralled to go to the theater and watch it. It's going to be something to where, oh, I'm just going to wait for this to see I'm streaming and call it a day. And that's the, the sad part about it because you don't want that to be the case. You want this to be something to where it's like everyone wants to go crazy about this. It'd be like, oh, if you're an old fan of The Crow, you're going to love this. If you're new, if you're a new fan of The Crow, if you're someone who's never heard of The Crow, you're going to love this and you're going to start getting into the entire uh, pop culture zeitgeist of it. You're going to start getting into the whole fandom. You're going to start getting into the whole world of The Crow. And it's going to lead to sequels and, and, and spinoffs and all that. And from here, from this version of The Crow, it doesn't seem like that. It just seems like it's just going to be 
you know, this funny movie that they'll make memes of because he looks like Florida Joker. He looks like Jared Leto's Joker. Um, it this seems like a movie where there's going to be some cool action sequences where you watch a YouTube clip of it and people are going to be like, man, that's pretty awesome. And it, it, like these scenes right here. And then you're going to talk about how like, yeah, Bill Skarsgård is cool. He carried it, but it's just done crazy. It just seems ordinary with some, you know, bad writing here. And the fact that the people who did this movie, who did the original 1994 film, um, you know, they're saying like they disavow this film. They, they, they don't recommend this at all. Like that goes to show that this this is not gonna work. Like like I, I say this right now. Look, you look at the 1994 version. This one has style. This one has got the tone. This one has something to where it's pulling you pulling you in. You're interested. You're just like okay, this seems fucking awesome. Especially at the height of the whole Gothic movement around that time period, it's like okay, this seems cool. And it's just like, okay, you see the difference in that. You see the difference between this and the 2024 version that we're going to get soon. Like Brandon Lee, just this whole work world, this whole world around it, the pacing of it. it it's like, okay, this, this team had a vision while the other people doing this reboot or whatever you want to call it, it, they just like, let's just bring in this popular character that's going to bring people into the seats and let's get them to watch this. And to me, it's like, okay, you're, you're getting halfway there, but you're forgetting the main elements that made The Crow amazing. And there's someone who watched the movie for the first time the last couple of days. So if I know that, then it should be obvious that you should know that. So I'm not going to get toxic on it because I'm not going to go crazy and, and be like, oh my God, they're ruining a masterpiece. It's like, no, like, like anything that's not above okay anything that anything that's not amazing anything that's below amazing is going to be disappointing for the true fans of the crow or for not the true fans for the hardcore fans of the crow and you're going to attract people who are going to be cool with this but in general this is this is probably not the right way to do a crow movie like this and you know that's just that's just my opinion on it but I'll still watch it. I'll still see how it is. You know, we're at a point now to where if a trailer like this comes out, people are going to get pissed before they even see it. And you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. So that's uh, that's something I'll, I'll touch on on that. I just wanted to be real. OK, that being said, let, let's let's go into this trailer. I'll be real. I, I did not like Rebel Moon Part One, but I'm I want to see what the fuck this goes on. I didn't even know this trailer came out and this got like like 7.4 near 7.5 million view let's go ahead and check this shit out because i'm i i am just like hey maybe this might be better maybe this might do something i don't i don't i don't fucking know let, let's let, let's watch this see what's up nightmare is you and I fighting together you must know you cannot win you're all here because there is nothing to return to dark days lie ahead of us all. We will teach you how to fight. That's impressive. The Scar give us a moment. Those this village holds most dear. I shall destroy them. have no choice but to fight.
this Gargi by herself. Go, 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 go! Are you truly prepared to allow this to continue in your name? I'm sorry. I won't allow this place to die for me. So it comes out April 19th. I'm going to be real. I'm not. Uh, I'm just not as hyped. Just not hyped. I'm like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful for the sake of being disrespectful. I'm just being honest. I'm after that first movie, I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not really into this. Like there's some interesting things here, but like, you know what this really puts me in a position of? This makes me think that maybe that maybe they could have went ahead and just made this a series. I'm gonna be honest, they could have made this a fucking series. I don't know if this need to be like a two or three part movie. Like I really don't think it needs to be the case. Like this is just all Zack Snyder. It's just a typical Zack Snyder film, all the beats to it, like nothing, nothing crazy, man. Like that, that that's all what it is. Like that's just what it gave me the vibe of I, I like the slow-mo the action sequences the characters the dialogue the the, the music I mean I'm I'm just uh like you know this part right here with the with robot with robot right here he, he's gonna do his cool ass thing that's gonna be fucking awesome but at the same time yeah slow-mo right here April 19th more slow-mo action sequences with visual effects, that's all CGI in this weird, weird depth of field. I, it, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be a Zack Snyder hater. I'm not that guy. I still really like Man of Steel. I think he was underrated in some of those movies. But in, in terms of the stuff he's doing on Netflix, I'm just not a big fan. But hey, April 19th, Rebel Moon Part Two, the Scar Giver. Uh, look out, look out, look out for that. Look, look out, look out for Rebel Moon Part Two, the Scar Giver. Whatever you want to fucking do with that. All right. I think that'll be it for today's episodes. Um, that being said, thanks so much for listening and watching us on Spotify. You can check us out on there, YouTube, TikTok, wherever that might be. And also on Instagram. And you can check out clips on all those different platforms. And I'll see you guys next time. Talk to you soon. Peace. <laughs>